Okay, so welcome everyone to this IMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. So for those of you who are not our regular uh, visitors, this is uh, the seminar of the IMP, International Association of Mathematical Physics, and you can look up uh, more about our organization in the chat and also you can join our um, mailing list. Um, all right, so today it's my great pleasure to introduce Alex Stromayer, who is going to talk about mathematical aspects of the Casimir effect and relative trace formula in spectrogeometry. So as usual, this is uh, recorded and you can watch it on our YouTube channel. Um, Alex, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting seminar. Uh, I was going to talk about, sorry, uh, it always jumps. I was going to talk a little bit about uh, ongoing work uh, for many years, actually, uh, with various people. So uh, with Florian Hanisch was my postdoc in, um, in Leeds for a while, Jan Longfang and then Alden Waters from Groningen. And there is also some numerical work with Timo Betke and Xiao Shu Sun, uh, his PhD student uh, from UCL. Uh, and what, this, what, is this, what it is about, I wanted to give a short introduction into the topic. And what I want to talk about is this configuration of objects here that you should think of as, uh, you know, metals or, or just some hard objects that are in space. And then we know from the famous work of Casimir that there is some kind of force between these objects because of vacuum fluctuations uh, in between the, the objects. And it has always been a challenge to compute these. Um, um, the first work of Casimir was, of course, an analytical computation uh, where you had to know the spectrum of the Laplace operator in this configuration. And then there is some analytic, uh, some regularization, the zeta function regularization taking place. But of course, you can do that only uh, if you have explicit knowledge of the spectrum, if the spectrum is discrete in the first place. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is how to understand this as, as a finite energy a priori without regularization. And uh, I want to give you also some connection to other formulas that are used. So what, how are we going to do the, the, the vacuum fluctuations? You would have to do some quantum field theory uh, in this configuration here with, say, let's say, Dirichlet boundary conditions on the objects. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, so we want to, for simplicity, I'll start with a free uh, scalar field of mass m. The mass m should be greater or equal zero. For, for example, it could be the massless scalar field. And in this case, the Hamiltonian would be just the square root of the Laplace operator with Dirichlet boundary condition, conditions on these objects. And by, for me, the Laplace operator is the positive Laplace. So some people call this here minus Laplace. So it has positive spectrum. And uh, so you can take the square root of the Laplace operator. This is just a self-adjoint operator. It's, of course, uh, unbounded and non-local. Still is a very well-defined self-adjoint operator. And then for the purposes of normal ordering or uh, you could say regularization in this context, you compare it with the free, uh, the free Laplace operator. So we have here the Laplace operator with Dirichlet boundary conditions on the objects. And here you have the Laplace operator with, uh, without any boundary conditions. That's the Laplace operator in R, Rd or R3 if you, if you want to be three-dimensional. And, and then uh, the only rigorous way uh, that I'm aware of to compute the Casimir force between two objects uh, coming from, uh, if you want, constructive or like uh, rigorous quantum field theories as follows. Um, so first of all, I should say a little bit of notation here. So I have this unbounded self adjoint operator H, and then I have the unbounded self adjoint operator H0, and I take that difference. Then this is actually an operator that has a smooth integral kernel in the sense of distributions. Uh, so this is actually, if I restrict this smooth integral kernel to the diagonal, it gives me a smooth function uh, as long as I'm staying away from the object. So what's written here is I take the first operator, I take the second operator, I subtract them from one another, and then I restrict the integral kernel to the diagonal. So this is a smooth function here. And this is very similar here. So you have h minus h to the minus one minus h zero to the minus one. So one has to say here, of course, that this is again, an un even the inverse of the Laplace operator is, is an unbounded operator, but C not infinity is contained in its domain. So this still is has a distributional integral kernel and it's different. The difference of these two operators is smooth. And so this is a formula for the energy density, if you wish. 
of the scalar field. So it's a smooth function uh, away from the objects. And then you have also the I chase component of the stress energy tensor. So these are given in terms of so operator theory, if you want. So if you if you notice the spectral resolution uh, and the integral kernels of all the functions of the Laplace operator with and without Dirichlet boundary conditions, you in principle able to compute these functions here. And then the formula for the Casimir energy is skipped. So the first thing that you have to note is that this TIHA component here is divergence free, uh, but it's singular near the objects. But what you can do is you can integrate around an object uh, and that will give you some, some force Fj. So what you do is you just, just uh, take any surface that enclose an object that stays however away from this. So in, in other words, it's homologous to, to the object that I'm interested in. I'm integrating this uh, renormalized stress energy tensor here around the object, staying away from the object at all times. And that gives me something because of the divergence freeness. It gives me something that is in, independent of that surface that I've chosen and it's a vector. So it's, I will interpret this as a force. So if you want, you can think of this stress energy tensor here as a, as a vector valued cohomology class, if you, if you like this kind of thinking. So in this case, sigma is a surface that encloses the object. And that's a priori finite. Of course, I have taken difference. So there is some kind of, uh, I guess, normal ordering going on or regularization if you prefer, but, but there is no, nothing more than that. Uh, it's really just taking differences. There is no mysterious extra cutoff involved. So this immediately gives you a force that you in principle could compute, but you can also see that how difficult that would be to compute for, arbitrary, for an arbitrary object, because you normally do not have these functions available. They are very non-local. And the other thing that I should say is, if you wanted to compute the energy, then this T0, zero component is not integrable. And the problem here is not the non-compactness of the setting. The problem is really that it's singular near the boundary of those objects. And that's the reason why it's why you cannot integrate it. Okay, so this, this is the problem. So the question is how to compute uh, either, T, either some kind of reasonable form of energy that gives you those forces or to compute those forces in a numerically efficient way. And of course, that's very hard, but um, there are Actually, papers in the physics literature that have very nice and very fast conversion formulas for the Casimir energy. Uh, let me just say what these are. So the, they're associated to these um, people here, or, or let's say a subset of the people who have written papers on this, maybe the first, uh, Kenneth Klich and Emiger in 2006. Um, I think that's maybe even earlier. A little bit, but this is based on a slightly different understanding of the Casimir forces between objects. It's not based on, on vacuum energy fluctuations of the quantum field between the objects. It's rather understood as something that emerges from vacuum fluctuations of currents on, on the surface or by, or by van der Waals forces essentially. And then you know you can write down some path integral that describes those Casimir forces and you eventually end up with a determinant formula. Um, so in this case, quite often it's written as the, as the quotient of two singular, not very well defined determinants, but in the end uh, you do mesh refinements and in the end the determinant gives you some finite number. And these finite numbers are actually used in, in this business to get asymptotics formulas, for example, what, what happens at large separation or when the objects are very close together and so on. So these are obviously, have been very, so these have been very influential, these formulas, and they're also very important because you can finally get your hands on computing these uh, Casimir energies. Uh, but of course, the question still remains open, how rigorous is that? So I've said already, these, these are all um, these are objects that you have to regularize, and there is an art of, of extracting a finite value out of these six. Uh, and then it's also not clear how this is related to, uh, to the other approach that gives you something finite right away. And, um, and certainly all these papers are not um, mathematically rigorous. Okay, so the, the task is somehow, or the, the project was to put this on uh, a mathematical rigorous um, ground and also to analyze the stability of the method and to improve also convergence and maybe get, get a little bit further than what we have so far. Okay, so if there are any, any questions about 
know, how to compute the Casimir energy, uh, then maybe it's a good time to ask, otherwise. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. th th these formulas that were on the previous slide. Yes. Uh, uh, so wh what is lowercase h i j? Here? Uh, you know, uh, H oh, I yeah, so, so I and J are here numbers between one and so either one, two, or three. Yeah. So here you have the space time component. This would be the energy density. So these are the spatial components. So IJ would be one, two, three. And then you're right. So to question me because I didn't really explain this here. Yeah, so yeah, this yeah, lower, lower case H. Uh, there's one over that? eight. Lowercase H. Oh, that's the metric. So, that, so that's the Euclidean metric. So delta, I should have said delta I J maybe. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so so the, the the situation is static. It's uh, so far. Uh, yes. Yes. It's this is R. This is R n. Yeah. So so the the Laplacian is three dimensional. It's n the, the Laplacian is the n n dimensional Laplacian. So the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but in the, in the, uh, <laughs> I mean, physical. I mean, uh, physically, this is the. In, this would be a three-dimensional Laplacian. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I mean, I mean uh, so so is it obvious that these are the, the objects that uh, that one needs to compute? I mean, it's. Uh, no. Uh, no, it's. I don't think it's obvious. I mean, this this is something which uh, it depends how much you know. I think people who do point splitting uh, regularization and Hadamard states, uh, they would say, well, it, well, I, still, I don't think it's obvious. But so this would be you take the state, the free state, the free Hadamard state, and then this is an interacting Hadamard state that you have that somehow enforces boundary conditions. You can reinterpret this here as saying that the difference between two Hadamard states is smooth. And uh, and uh, so this would be the the normal order stress energy tensor with respect to this state here, the, the free state. You can think of it in this way. Yeah, so yeah. I, I'm a little worried that this is not uh, uh, symmetric with respect to the uh, replacement of H and H zero, uh, but maybe it's. Um, yeah, it's not because uh, so the reference state is is the one where you say the energy is zero, right? That would be okay. this one here. So it should be anti-symmetric with respect to changing them, and, and it is. Okay. Perfect. So I'm, I'm just giving you a historical overview. Uh, actually, I mean, we will work with something I would think is better than that. So we'll, I'll start over now. So one 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 thing of you know starting over means that you you also have to change your notation. <laughs> Sorry for that. That was not intentional. But our domain is now called omega. And for the simplicity, I want to have only two domains, omega one and omega two. And I want to understand somehow what the force between th these domains are. And I will do this in RD for D greater equal to. Uh, it's nice to also include the two-dimensional situation because maybe the, you want to do some dimensional reduction at some point. And here are a couple of operators that I, that I want to define. Um, so you have the Laplace operator that we already had before. And uh, if you know what this means, so this is just uh, a, a, a fast way of defining Dirichlet boundary conditions. Uh, if you don't know what it means, just ignore. So this is the Laplace operator with Dirichlet conditions on object one and on object two. So that's a self adjoint operator. And I'm only defining the Dirichlet boundary conditions, and this is, this is really important, on the boundary. So this means that this operator is actually a direct sum of two operators of the exterior Laplace operator, which has absolutely continuous spectrum, and an interior Laplace operator, which has completely discrete spectrum. Okay, so this operator is still uh, acting on L2 on the entire Hilbert space, L2 of R, RD. And then I can also define the Laplace operator delta J. So there are two of them in this case. We have delta one, which has Dirichlet boundary conditions on omega one and uh, doesn't see omega two at all. And the operator Laplace two, which has the Ridgely boundary conditions on omega two, but doesn't see object omega one at all. Yeah. So these are these are these are the two boundary. Con uh, these are the two operators that um, that come naturally with these configurations. If you have more than two obstacles, then of course you have more of these operators. And then we also have the free Laplace operator on R D without any 
boundary conditions anywhere. So this is the Laplace operator that doesn't see any object. So if you want to use these Laplace operators, for example, to solve the, the Schrodinger equation or the wave equation, this would really mean that the wave just passes through the through any object. And this, these are the operators where the wave is only scattered off the object omega j. And this operator here sees all objects together. And I should also say that then we can just in the usual way by the spectral theorem for self adjoint operators, we can form functions of, of, these op of every single one of these operators. For example, we can take it to the power one half as we had before to define our Hamiltonian, or we can also take it to the power S. Uh, we actually have a much more general result than that, but I just want to give you an example of the power of these formulas. So I, I'm raising it to the power S. Uh, do not expect any zeta function regularization uh, because it's absolutely not necessary. So I'm, I'm just introducing this to show you a little bit how, how powerful these formulas are. Um, no, no, no further regularization. Uh, will be done. Okay, so this, these are the operators I can define for any S. Uh, some of them are unbounded. In particular, if S is greater than zero, this is an unbounded operator. Um, maybe there is something to say still about this. Um, it's an unbounded operator when S is greater than zero, as I said, but it's still densely defined on compactly supported smooth functions that are supported away from, from the obstacle from the boundary of the obstacle and therefore it has a distributional kernel so every single one of these operators defines a distribution away from the open set that i get by if i remove the boundary of every obstacle and then here is already the first result of what i call the relative trace um, so i take this s greater zero and if you're interested in the casimir operator you should be taking s equal to one half so did I say Casimir operator? If you let me start this sentence again, um, if you want to take the Casimir energy, if you're interested in Casimir energy, you should be taking S is equal to one half here. So Laplace plus M squared to, to the power one half minus Laplace one plus M squared to the power one half minus Laplace two plus M squared to the power one half plus the free one to the power one half. These are all, every single one of them is an unbounded operator. But this particular linear combination is a trace class operator. So this is this is the theorem, and its trace um, you can compute by integrating to it has a smooth integral kernel dsx comma y on the diagonal, and this smooth integral kernel on the diagonal. So if you put x equals y, that's what I call the diagonal. It has a certain decay. So I guess we are interested in dimension three and s equal to one half. Um, no, I didn't prepare this. Um, so I guess it's one alpha to the power x to the power of five, I believe. So that's enough decay to integrate it. And the good thing is that this uh, kernel is also smooth up to the boundary. It's not smooth across the boundary, but it's smooth up to the boundary. So you can integrate it. So this is a trace class operator. This trace can be computed by integrating this kernel here. So that's the upshot. But I should say that um, the theorem says it's this ds is trace class. This is a much stronger statement than just to say that the integral kernel on the diagonal is integrable. So this is just this, you know, it follows from it that the integral kernel on the diagonal is integrable, but it's actually trace class is a much stronger property than that. Um, because this is not a positive operator, you can see here minuses as well. So then in this case, you don't have this equivalence anymore. Um, but the more powerful part of the theorem allows you to compute this trace name as follows. So this is the formula that we proved. So we have trace of ds is equal to, well, there is this factor here. And then you have this integral here. So you can see that everything in this integral is uh, nice, uh, but we need to know this function capital Xi. Uh, this is the function. That, so we can see from this formula. So let me try to remember this formula here. As soon as you have the function xi, you can compute all these traces of all these powers of the Laplace operator, all these variations of the Laplace operator. So we need to know this function xi here. And since I didn't tell you what it is, uh, you can't compute anything yet. Um, go to the next slide where we, I'm actually telling you what this is. So the function xi is a, is a well-defined Fredholm determinant. 
So if you have an operator, which is one plus a trace class operator, uh, then you can compute, take the eigenvalues of this operator and just multiply them all up. And this condition that it's one plus a trace class operator makes uh, this uh, product convergent. This is called the thread home determinant. So in this function xi is uh, the log that of this thread of this operator here. And S lambda is not the scattering matrix. It's the thing. Sorry for that. So S lambda is uh, the so-called single layer operator. And the, the good news is that this is something that has an explicit kernel, namely. Uh, so that would be nice to be able to write it down. Um, so you take the free resolvent uh, kernel. So in, in dimension three, this is just. Uh, e to the i lambda x modulus of x minus y divided by four pi x minus y. So this is a completely explicit function that you can compute very fast. And then you restrict this resolvent kernel to the object, to the boundary of the object. So this is the gamma here is the Sobolev uh, trace. So in other words, you, and you get an, a new operator, which you think of as an integral operator on the boundary. So I, I hope this is clear because I can't, um, I don't uh, write down anything. So once again, you take the free resolvent kernel and you think of it as an integral operator on the boundary by restricting it to the boundary. So it's a very explicit kernel. And so it, it's well known to have, you know, between Sobolev spaces on the boundary to have certain mapping properties in particular, it's a pseudo differential operator of order minus one. So this is known. Um, there, uh, there is no, no problem here at all at zero. So the limit lambda goes to zero exists and it's a, it's a regular. Uh, in dimension two, uh, it's not holomorphic, but it's not really a problem. One can, one can deal with this. Uh, anyway, so this is an operator that you have numerically under control. If you, if you discretize the boundary using some you know, triangulation, you can actually approximate this operator as lambda very fast by a matrix. There is uh, no, nothing complicated involved here. So, okay, but you can also do this. You can also extract from this the part that you get, uh, which acts on the boundary itself, on the chase component of the boundary. So again, you can do this on every object separately and you get another operator. Okay, let's call it the single layer operator on the object J. And the, 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 the complete operator is lambda, uh, of course, it's not diagonal. It, it somehow sees the other object as well. And so what you have here is that this is not the identity, but it, chain, it somehow uh, is not far away from the identity. So this, this is a well-defined function here that in principle you can compute. And you can compute it numerically quite well, reasonably fast, let's say, and in a stable way. So this here is one plus a trace class operator. And then as lambda goes along the imaginary axis, it decays very fast. So are there any questions uh, so far about this operator? So this operator is numerically computable and you can also say, say a lot about its properties. It's, well, it's holomorphic in the upper half space. Uh, it's regular at zero. It has a continuous boundary volume. In dimension three, it's actually holomorphic at, at zero and it exponentially decays at a certain rate. So that's, that's what you know about it. And uh, this trace here is, is, is equal. So the trace of this operator here is equal to this, to this here. And my claim is that this is the Casimir energy when S is equal to one half. Okay, uh, any, any questions? Or shall I continue? Yeah, I think you can carry on. Okay. So the, the sub, this is here not so important. Uh, the Sobolev space is, I just wrote it down. If you're in the Lipschitz case and you have a corner, then you should choose S equals minus a half. And then, then you, should, you can think of these operators in this way. But um, if you have a smooth boundary, you can choose as, as, uh, as you like. And then this determinant will actually not depend on which S you chose. Okay, so for, for a rigorous definition of the Casimir energy um, without any regularization, so once again, this is a trace class operator, right? So we can take its trace and you can choose any orthonormal basis to compute its trace, or you can take the integral kernel and, and, and integrate it along the diagonal. It will always be the same uh, answer. And 
let's define the Casimi energy to be one half trace of the one half. Uh, and this is now fully justified by the following theorem. Um, namely, if you move one object rigidly somewhere, then this is actually a differentiable family of trace class operators in the Hilbert space L2. And its derivative equals that integral that I showed you on the first slide. So in other words, if you use this energy, this one that I just defined, um, to compute the force, you're getting the same answer that you get uh, with the other uh, um, formula and Jan was pointing out is not symmetric with respect to change swapping around H and H zero. Yeah, so, so that the one that you got from, from the spatial components of the stress energy tensor that is basically not really computable in any reasonable uh, numerical way. So if, if you want to compute this, all you need to do is to take this energy and differentiate it. So this is uh, non-trivial that this is a differentiable family of trace class operators. In fact, we'll see later that this is probably not true for the electromagnetic field. Okay, so you can differentiate it um, not only in a formal way, but you can actually differentiate in the space of trace class operators. So this is something that is um, not at all, as you can see, this is from last year. So we had to use the Hadamard variation formula for the resolvent, uh, but in fact, we had to prove the Hadamard variation formula for the resolvent because the whole setting is non-compact. And uh, apparently all these uh, other theorems that states the Hadamard variation formula were all done in the compact case. Uh, but our uh, proof was a bit simplified by the fact that we take only rigid deformations so that's a bit easier. Yeah? If, you, if you deform the object also, then I don't think that this is true anymore. So then you don't have a, fam a trace class, uh, differentiable family of trace class operators. So you, it's actually important that you do not also deform the object. Okay, so I'll go to the next slide then. So what is also an important comment here, uh, in the whole treatment, it is really important to not forget about the interior. So if you forget about the interior, then these formulas are probably not true. So first of all, you can't even say, uh, you can't even write down this relative trace because the, the operators have, all have to be defined on the same Hilbert space. Then you might try to cut it off somehow. I don't think you will get the right formula for the energy. Um, well, I think, I checked and you don't get the, the right formula for the energy. So the reason is because this relative energy is not smooth across, uh, across uh, it's not the reason, but I should also say that the relative energy density is not smooth across the boundary. So there are some, the normal derivative has a jump. Okay, let me just summarize what we've learned so far. The summary is that we can compute the Casimir energy if we only have this function Xi. And it's the same formula for all the massive scalar fields for different masses. So once you know this Xi, you can have to compute it only once, then you can compute the Casimir energy for all uh, masses. It's one formula. Where well, this uh, thing here is just numerically accessible by a single, operate, single layer operators, in fact, one dimension less than the problem. This is two dimensional. There's this a significant, uh, significant simplification. And that's also the reason why this formula in the physics in physics, um, were such a such a, uh, a big step to the computability of um, of the Casimi energy. Okay, and in the massless case, we have this very simple formula that all you need to do is to take this function xi and integrate it along the imaginary axis, where in fact it decays exponentially fast. Good. So the question is, how fast does it decay? And because um, if you know how fast it decays and what the asymptotic behavior is, uh, you can compute it faster. So you still have to compute quite a lot. So every single point in this integral means that you have a very high dimensional matrix whose determinant you have to compute. Um, so you still have to compute quite a bit and then you have to integrate the result uh, along the imaginary axis that still takes a while. So maybe every point will take maybe let's say five minutes on the computer. So the more points, uh, the, the less points you have to compute, the better. And that's why the more you know here, for example, Xi at zero, what is that? 
or what is the asymptotic behavior as a lambda goes to infinity, all these things will help you. I mean, here are also the interesting relations that come up uh, to, to micro-local analysis and, and I would say pure mathematics. Namely, the first one is are the so-called wave trace invariants that have been studied for a long, long time in the inverse uh, spectral problems. Um, and it's like, again, something has come up where I wanted to draw something, but maybe I'll try to explain. Um, so this Xi lambda has an exponential decay of this type here, and there is some four factor and some error term. Yeah, so that's the theorem. Um, maybe I should say what, what, what is what. Maybe first the assumption. So this assumes that both objects are convex near what I call is a bound, bouncing ball orbit. Maybe I do actually stop sharing the screen now and try to draw some picture because otherwise it's, I think it's very difficult to understand what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, oh no, okay. There it is. So let's say this is object one. Uh, sorry, it's a two-dimensional picture. I'm just not very good at. So you can see that this is not convex, right? But there is really only one. So if I, there is a geodesic bouncing ball orbit which goes back and forth, and this there is only one that realizes the minimal distance between the objects, which I call A. So this goes back and forth here. Yeah, this is a billiard trajectory. So what I what my requirement is that near this these two points here, I want this to be convex, and you can see that in the picture that this is the case. And so if you wiggle a little bit with this geodesic, it will eventually go somewhere else. And there is a Poincaré map which I call pi gamma, uh, which describes this the linearized Poincaré map. If you, if you choose a symplectic transversal here, the derivative of of the Poincaré map, if you want it. This bouncing ball orbit describes the dynamics of, of this billiard trajectory. And the point is this, this the minimal distance A between the objects and this and the dynamics of this billiard trajectory is actually enough to describe the decay of xi lambda. So this decay of xi lambda is uh, encoded in this billiard trajectory. And this is something that comes up in spectral geometry in the doistamat gilliman trace formula. And I think physicists call it the Gutzwiller trace formula, um, where you somebody, everybody knowing that Gutzwiller trace formula would, would recognize this factor. So this is not a coincidence. So once again, so this is the decay of Xi. So you, you, can, you know this here. You can also compute this number here. So this is the typical Gutzwiller trace formula contribution. So this J is, we're summing here are all possible uh, billiard trajectory that realize the minimal distance. So for example, in dimension three, this is very explicit. Uh, so you have, um, you know, uh, the principal curvatures at the point where the two desic hits. There is one on object one and one on object two, R1 row one, R2 row two. So you have the principal radius of curvatures. And then there is also an angle, which, which tells you how uh, the, the angle between the, the, pla the planes of these um, curvatures. So you can see this is all very explicit and then you get this deep this, uh, principle, this leading term in the asymptotic expansion of this function psi. And that's also what we see in numerics. So it's all very nice because once you have that asymptotic and you're close to it, you can stop computing points because you know that this is going to continue that way. Um, so this is a result that I obtained with uh, uh, Yan Longfang, who was the same on the previous slide, uh, that's also published uh, very recently actually. And, it gives a relation to, to the computation of these wave trace invariants. And I think that this is very similar to what Steve Selich has done in the inverse spectral problem, um, where he solves that analytic planar set two symmetric domains are actually determined by their spectrum. So that's also not done by, by directly computing wave trace invariants, but rather using some interesting relation to, to single layer operators. Slightly different one, but you can see that this is related here. Uh, maybe I'll not say anything about this. Um, maybe I, I will. So the, you can do some a similar analysis when you have transmissive boundary conditions. And I would say that's actually 
maybe even a more interesting physics situation because uh, well, I don't know if you have two glass balls, for example, they're not conducting, but you have some kind of uh, in jump in the refraction index. And, and there is also a Fourier integral operator that describes that. And, and there, is, there is something that we computed a while ago, um, 2013, um, that allows you to actually generalize this formula here to this case. So that's something that, well, I don't know why I put it there. That's something I know how to do, but I haven't done. But I just want to say that this is also an interesting relation uh, to something that was, was written for a completely different reason. But I think it can be used for, for the computation of Casimir energy. OK, so this brings me to, to the work with uh, Betke and Swun, where we can actually do now very large problems. Um, using the computational elect electromagnetic uh, electrodynamic tool BAM++. Um, so this is actually a ready tool and the code to compute those Casimir energies for a scalar field and for the electromagnetic field uh, is not very complicated. Uh, can actually be done maybe in a couple, one page. And I wanted to show you a little bit how this works. So we use, maybe I'll not explain here the details of this, but the problems that you're dealing with is that as the problems become very large, you'd have to invert these very large matrices and, and then you'd have to save them in a, on a computer and at some point this, you run out of storage space. So there are some tricks you can get around this and we're currently writing this up, uh, but I wanted to show you a pretty picture. So for example, here is a numerical computation. You can see if you zoom in here, so these are two ellipsoids. Uh, I will not tell you what the dimensions are. So what you can do is you can rotate it uh, along the z-axis this way. So you just two, take two metallic x and you, you rotate one of them this way. You can also let it go around that way. And here you can see some numerical computation um, of, I think this is minus the Casimir energy. So what you can see here, I think, is that the um, Easter eggs want to align. Um, and, and here, I think the, the better configuration is where I think most of the Easter egg is close to the other Easter egg. Um, well, I just didn't really manage to take a, the, the bigger ones. Uh, we actually have much more uh, complicated numerics with four Easter eggs that rotate among, uh, between each other and so on. Um, so all these things are now um, numerically accessible in a stable in a stable way. I think that's, that's very nice to have. Um, if you want to look for equilibrium points, for example, in complicated configurations, such for, as, a, as the one I showed you before, the one where you have a torus. So by the way, I, I was planning to talk 50 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's, that's the usual <laughs> time, yes. But if you have much more to say, obviously, I you can carry on a bit. I just wanted to check. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So it's okay if you go over time a bit. Yeah, thank you. I, I don't think I will, but yeah. Okay, so this is very nice because you can, you can make numerical experiments. And, uh, it's fast enough to, to, to actually compute these curves in a reasonable time. Uh, so you can see that there are a lot more um, parameters you want to vary. Uh, for example, what is very interesting for the duration, in my opinion, is uh, several tori and maybe a ball between them. So we do, we're doing this just just now. Good, so I do have a little bit of time, so I, I should say something about expert uh, to experts in scattering theory. Uh, I know at least one uh, is, is, is present. So the, um, there is this thing which is called the biermann krein formula, and that relates uh, operator traces to, to the scattering matrix. And maybe just explain what this is. So the biermann krein formula, and now S, you can see if you look very closely that this is a different S, this is the S from the scattering matrix. So there is something that is called the scattering phase, the Xi lambda here. So it, it's really a scattering phase. As you can see, you take the determinant of the scattering matrix, which again, you have to prove exists, but that again exists as a, as a threshold determinant. So you take the log tad of the scattering matrix, uh, and then you can compute this uh, Xi, which is called the spectral shift function or the scattering phase. And of course, you can do that for every for the compound object and the objects individually, and you get this so-called relative spectral shift function. And indeed, this relative spectral shift function can compute differences of traces, just as the one that I showed you. 
Um, however, only if if um, you know that the differences between the operators are already trace class, and what you need for that is is that uh, the power has to be negative. So in our case, the power of in front of the Laplace operator or the, that we raise the Laplace operator to is one half. That's not negative. And so you cannot use the Biemann Krein formula to compute that. Now you could say, well, maybe that's just, uh, you know, I can't use the Biemann Krein formula, but maybe still the formula is correct. But that's also not the case. So this Xi lambda uh, does not give you an, an integrable function. And that's really a big pity for numerics because. Um, so this Xi function, the scattering matrix are actually easy to access numerically. So they, they come ready-made basically from these boundary element computer programs that I, that I mentioned before. So if you, if you had a formula that where you can easily extract this, uh, the, the Casimir energy from the scattering matrix, that would be very nice, but such a formula doesn't, doesn't work. And the reason is this, so this little Xi function is actually the imaginary part of the capital Xi function. And you need the capital Xi function to compute the Casimir energy, but you only have the imaginary part. So it's a little bit like um, solving a Riemann Hilbert problem. So you, you know, you want to integrate, I don't know, sine X, uh, but you can't do it. So you split sine X, uh, you know, into two parts, e to the I uh, X and e to the minus I X. And every single term, every single, every term individually can then be integrated along the imaginary axis, but of course sine x itself cannot. And that, that's a little bit the problem you have here. So this data that you get from the scattering matrix is really only the imaginary part of that formula. Anyway, so it's still an important formula. Uh, it's something that Gilles Caron uh, has proved holds in this case. Uh, if you interpret this correctly, so, um, I think you have to do some kind of theta regularization to, to get to relate it to, to this Dirichlet to Neumann map. Um, but it does fo follow somehow individually. Uh, you can compute this Xi function from, from this a single layer operator as well. So Tarot has shown this and uh, this generalizes work by Simon and Gestesi, uh, so Barry Simon and Fritz Gestesi, who've done this for rank one perturbations. Um, so this is a very nice paper by, by Gilles Caron. So the upshot is that you cannot compute this DS directly from the Biermann Krein formula. So you'd have to say quite a lot to be able to do it mathematically. Of course, mathematically you can solve this Riemann Hilbert problem, but it's not a, a, a numeric in, in a, it's not a stable way. So numerically, I don't think you can you can actually use that um, that formula. Okay, so maybe I'll just go back again. So here it is. So the Biermann Krein formula tells you that. The, the difference here is trace class if S is negative and M is positive. And then you can, can use it to compute those differences. But here we have S greater zero and then you cannot use it. And what I should say again is that in this case here where S is greater zero, this is the only linear combination that is trace class. I think I wanted to say that, but I didn't say it before. So there is only a, in, in the span of these four operators, there is a one dimensional subspace of trace class operators only one dimensional. There is nothing else you can write down that is trace class. All the others are not. Sorry, only multiples of this operator are trace class. Go back. So, so far the, the biemann krein formula is a very nice formula. And certainly, you know, the, uh, there is a relation even to the earlier discussion uh, uh, of the Casimir effect. So the Krein was also involved in, in you know, uh, Lifshitz, uh, Lifshitz formalism and Lifshitz analysis of the, of the Casimir energy. Okay, um, so far the scalar field. So for the scalar field, now I think this is, the answer is very satisfactory. You have uh, various methods to compute this and we proved that they all give the same answer. Uh, what about Maxwell's equations? And the interesting thing here is that this is much harder. Um, for various reasons. Um, so I'll now restrict myself to dimension three. Um, but then uh, yeah, my collaborator wanted to do Lipschitz domains, which I agreed to, and then later on <laughs> regretted it a little bit. Uh, but now that the paper is finished, I'm no longer regretting it. So this is nice, of course, because then you can allow in the formalism, you can allow um, things that have corners uh, or you know deal with cubes. 
So let me just, because I have only five minutes left and I'm somehow guessing that not everybody is interested in the details of these function spaces. Let me just say what, what the result is. So first of all, um, there is boundary layer theory for Maxwell's equations. And the final formula for the calcium energy will actually look exactly the same. But there are some analytical differences to the definitions of what the operators are, and they're quite significant. OK, let's go through these spaces nevertheless. So we, I'm using differential form notation because I, I find it easier. But if you don't, uh, whenever you see delta d, that's going to be curl curl. And when, whenever you see delta, that's going to be diff to the divergence. Um, so then we have this H1D space here, which is not the first Sobolev space. It's only the first Sobolev space in certain directions. So this is the space of functions which are in L2, whose derivative, so exterior derivative, so these are vector functions, the exterior derivatives is in L2. So only the curl is in L2. So it's kind of, kind of a half-baked Sobolev space, if, if you want. Yeah. And then there is this other space, which is called h minus a half diff or h minus a half delta. In the smooth case, uh, you can directly define it like this. Um, so this is uh, the h minus a half sections. When you apply the surface delta to it, uh, you get h minus a half. OK, so this is somehow h one half in certain directions and h minus a half in other directions. And in the same way as you have the, the trace restriction map for Sobolev spaces, there is this tangential trace map here. So what you do is you take the function and you, if it's continuous, you take the function, vector valid function, and you restrict it to the boundary, and then you, you uh, cross it by the normal vector. And of course, this has the effect that it immediately gets rid of, of, um, of the normal component and keeps only the tangential component. So now this is not, um, you know, if you do category theory, this is not a very, uh, this is not a good map, but historically that's what people use. Um, so if you wanted to get the tangential restriction for differential forms, you should do another new cross, but it doesn't really affect the formulas that much. So this is a nice theorem. It tells you that the trace map is defined in this way. So the, this is a superior, uh, way of, of dealing with Lipschitz domains, because these are the correct function spaces that you should use uh, when, you do, when you're when doing um, domain, Lipschitz domains and maybe arguably even more general domains. This has, is not so old, so this was realized only recently, I would say, uh, by Costa Bell in the 90s, who identified those spaces and, and, and showed that the right spaces and then various people adapted even this, the BEM spaces that are used in boundary element methods um, are constructed in such a way that they approximate these spaces so that everything is actually uh, correctly approximated. So these are the right spaces to use. Okay, so the names that Ufa, Maya, and then we used also the book, very nice book by Kirsch. Um, we were also very influenced by, by the work by Mitre. What does the letters B E M yeah. stand for? Sorry? The B E M. Oh, yeah. Boundary element methods. So you triangulate the surface. And then you, usually with this triangulation, there is some, some function space that comes with it. And you also usually choose some inner product. And naively, you would take the L2 inner product. But if you want to approximate this uh, in, in the correct function spaces and you have corners, the, the theory tells you that you should really be approximating the H minus a half diff function space. And people who do computational electrodynamics using these boundary element methods do choose those spaces. OK, and, and then when you have that, there is the so-called Maxwell single layer operator. So and you can see that this is, this is an operator from H minus a half delta to H minus a half delta. So it acts on those uh, adapted spaces. Uh, and the major difference to the, to the scalar case is that this is no longer regularity improving. You can see that this goes from, this, from the space to itself. Whereas in the scalar case, this was a pseudo differential operator of order minus one, and therefore was actually better behaved. Okay, so you can, this is defined almost in the same way. You can see that you take the free resolvent, but then there is this delta curl curl here, which transforms it into a zero order operator. 
and then you have these uh, restrictions which are still well defined so this okay i don't go into too much detail uh, slightly unpleasant from a technical point of view is that this uh, single layer operator is no longer invertible at zero but has a very unpleasant infinite rank pole at lambda equals zero that you can, that we have explicitly described in order to analyze everything here but it stops you from using meromorphic threshold theory directly at least good and so yeah what I, so i wrote a very long paper in cmp about uh, how to express uh, the the stress energy tensor in, in this in this setting and what would be the the corresponding relative um, relative trace and so the upshot is, and I don't want to go into the details of this, if you do the gupta bleuler uh, quantization of the electromagnetic field, uh, then there are two terms. One comes from the electrostatic charges on the obstacles, and then there is another term which comes from the vacuum fluctuations, and these are the ones that I've written down here. So essentially, there are two components. They both contribute equally. So let's maybe for this, because of time, let's focus only on one of them. So what you should do is you take the Laplace operator, However, you take the Laplace operator on co uh, with relative boundary conditions. So these are vector fields. Um, so you, the tangential component is zero and the normal component is, uh, is not. And you take the, so this is called relative boundary conditions or metallic boundary conditions. This gives rise to a self adjoint operator also in the same way as it does for functions. But you should take this to the power minus a half and then apply delta curl curl to it or delta D to it. And so this is well defined. This combination is well defined. And this linear combination is the right thing to do. So that was somehow the upshot uh, of this paper. But uh, maybe let's go to the most recent result from 2021. So this is on the archive. Um, that when S is greater minus one, this operator here is trace class. And this trace can be computed from this here. Uh, this time, however, the Xi has changed its meaning. The L lambda is, um, so it's the same formula as before, but this time the L lambda is the Maxwell uh, single layer operator, and it's supposed to be interpreted on this right function space H minus a half delta. So you can see that this formula here um, gives you the Kazem energy. The, the thing that you're interested in here is S equals minus a half, which is covered here. Uh, that's that would be the Kazemi energy. Um, what you cannot do, and that shows you that how complicated things are, you could try to do some kind of Hodge decomposition, or I think applied mathematicians have a different name for it, but I, I, I forgot now. Um, you know, you apply, you you decompose into closed and co-closed, into curl and diffs. Um, I forgot what it's called. So there is there is some decomposition you could do. And that doesn't doesn't work directly here, and that's, that's somehow the complication. So if you put s equals minus a half, this becomes the projection onto the space of co-closed forms, and then funny uh, this linear combination is no longer trace class. I think it isn't. I mean, the theorem doesn't say it is, but I th in fact, I think it is not trace class. And so you can then compute the the Kazemi energy. So, but however, so if you anyway, so this discussion I think uh, settles it. This theorem settles it. You have to put s equals minus a half, and then the Kazemi energy can can be computed from this um, single Maxwell single layer operators. And the theorem also tells you what the correct function spaces are to compute or uh, to compute this Kazemi energy. And uh, so this this provides the numerical. This provides the justification of using all these methods with those function spaces. Um, maybe I'll, I think I'm a little bit over time. Uh, That's I've already all right all yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've already said all these things anyway. So um, <laughs> maybe a complication. So project, you try to tempt, you could be tempted to use the Birman Grind formula or something like that and just project to the co-closed forms. And when we started this project several years ago, that's what I thought one should do. <laughs> but then it turns out that this is actually very complicated because this decomposition into closed and so I call it the Hodge decomposition. There is a Helmholtz decomposition. That's what it's called. The Helmholtz decomposition, you know, the decomposition into curl, curl free and uh, diff free and and harmonic forms depends heavily on the boundary conditions, and and so you can't actually do that without because you do it for one operator and then you have a different operator to compare with, 
it has a different Helmholtz decomposition. So which projection are you going to use? Uh, so you know you have to work on the on the correct space, and these are the right formulas. So it took quite long to figure out. Then we have the pole at zero. Uh, the, the formula in the end turns out is well defined and finite only because a lot of poles cancel out. So and they're not of all of the same type. So some are there. The infinite rank ones are there because of pure gauge, but there are other others there that are because of topolo for topological reasons. So some papers say that the polarization should be non-trivial, but our paper doesn't assume that. So on, for example, if you have tori or so, then you certainly have those moles appear as well. Okay, there is a little bit of outlook here. There is a lot to do, as you can see. We want to be able to compute energy densities. I'm actually writing a, a reduction formula that could also be useful in this context. And uh, well, I'm also interested in, in space times where this whole discussion becomes a lot more com more complicated um, because of the lack of translation invariance. Um, but I think that's ultimately where this whole where this all goes. Um, and so here are all the all the papers that we've written so far. If you want to to take a look, and I think I'll stop here. I think that's the last page. Let's see. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. That was a very instructive talk. Um, are there any questions? Uh, may I yeah. have a question? Yeah. Uh, so uh, you started with some formulas for the uh, energy momentum tensor. Yes. Uh, at, at the very beginning. Uh, yes. But then you actually used uh, a, a, another formula uh, yes. for something that you called ECAS, e and uh, which involved the D sub S. Yes. And uh, so uh, my my question is, what is the relationship uh, between the original uh, energy momentum formulas and uh, yes. yeah? So that's exactly answered by this theorem here. Um, so it says that if you differentiate this uh, ECAS, so if you move one of the objects, this will actually change in a differentiable way. And if you differ differentiate, then you get the same thing that you get from integrating this stress energy tensor around an object. Yes, so, so this gives a relationship uh, to the um, uh, stress tense, I mean, the, the spatial components. Yes, uh, yes. What about the uh, the temporal component? There was uh, yeah. So, so that that's not integrable. So so th this this does not enter in. Uh, I mean, the... no. This does it does enter somehow. Um, so you can see that there is. So this is the same term, right? So you could take the C zero zero component and you could say, well, that's H minus H zero, which is not integrable, right? Uh, but then you can subtract the term that you get from h1 minus h0 and h2 minus h0, and then you would get something that is integrable. Okay, so you have to renormalize uh, again. I mean, yeah, you have to renormalize again. So, so I think the correct way of so I didn't say this, but in the paper we actually say this. So the way I think the correct physics uh, physics argument goes is if you want uh, object, maybe I'll actually uh, draw this. Uh, Let's see, sorry, it's not fast, but I think it's still better to, to draw. So here is the picture, right? So, so we have here omega one, right? And then we have omega two. Oops, omega two. You can see that? Yeah. Okay. So I want to understand what these, the force on omega one is because of the presence of omega two. So what I should really be doing is I should look at the state at two states. So the state omega, and I should compare it to the state omega twiddle. So if I want to know what the force on omega one is, then omega one omega should be the state that I have without, without omega two. But still omega one still there. And omega twiddle should be the state with both objects there, right? And then I should, uh, I should normal order Omega twiddle with respect to omega. Right? But you see, the, the, the Minkowski vacuum doesn't, doesn't appear here at all. 
I never talk about the free Laplacian. But so if you in, if you take this state and you take the, the the spatial component of the stress energy tensor and integrate around omega one, it's actually perfectly regular even up to the boundary. You get the same force. That's what we proved. But that's not obvious. Not that's not obvious at all. And in fact, you need this second term to be able to do that. Uh, so this. It's quite an interesting discussion where you know mathematics is a lot harder than than formal computations um, because um, if you if you're a physicist you see that the Laplace right delta and you're integrating over that you'd be saying well that's just the divergence term and I'm just going to skip it but in fact uh, there are a couple of computations where this divergence term actually makes it work. So maybe I'll share the screen again so that you, so this term here that that actually makes it work. You can't just use this one, but together they this together they this makes a divergence free. Oh no! So what am I saying? So yeah. So for I, I don't remember where in detail this enters, but but it really one has to consider both of them together. Uh, may I have another question? Yes, I sure. Uh, so, uh, suppose instead of hard obstacles, uh, you have uh, smooth potentials, uh, and uh, so so you, you can also uh, mm -hmm. think of Casimir energy between such yes. potentials, and you can move them as well. So yes. you can yeah. essentially re repeat. Uh, uh, the, the, wouldn't it be simpler? I mean, you, you. I mean, you would not have to uh, to understand these. Uh, I mean, layer uh, uh, subalert spaces and. Uh, no, no, but I mean, yeah, maybe yes, but you see, the there is a the determinant formula is actually really important because it it makes it accessible numerically. There is a dimensional yeah. reduction going on here because you, the the single layer operator you would have to do if you wanted to go to the to a lower dimensional situation where things are not that complicated anymore. Uh, and moreover, in the, if you're in the electromagnetic case, then, uh, then you can't do this potential thing. Um, so I guess you are correct, however, if, if you wanted to just um, understand the Dirichlet problem, you could try to add a potential and then maybe either let the potential become very big or not, right? Uh, depending on what you're interested in. Um, so I guess, yeah, I don't, I don't see, I don't see any obstacle for doing that. I don't think that you would. Uh, it would be much easier. I would say that it probably wouldn't be easier to do it that way. Yeah, yeah. So, so you're saying that uh, the Dirichlet uh, situation can be uh, modeled with a potential. Now, uh, now in the electromagnetic case, I suppose you also need the Neumann uh, situation. Yeah, so maybe you can do it. Uh, you can also model it by by letting you know, epsilon go to infinity or something like this. Right. Yeah. So I mean, there are these are built in here, right? So uh, if we go back to this here, so I've, I've actually maybe it was it was a bit too fast. So in the in the electromagnetic case. Um, these are relative boundary conditions, so they are kind of mixed. Uh, they, there is a Dirichlet and the Neumann component. I mean, the, the Neumann component is also not so easy. Um, so these are the boundary conditions that you get uh, automatically if you want, if you have a weak formulation and you you require that that um, that the tangential part uh, vanishes. So and then I think the the co-derivative of the co-derivative should have vanishing normal part. So these are called in topology. They are called relative boundary conditions because they, the Hodge theory gives relative cohomology. Um, I don't know what they are called in um, in the rest <laughs> of, of the literature. Um, I mean, these are the natural relative. These are the rel the, the the natural boundary conditions you get that can get you get for either E field if you describe it with the Laplacian. But if if the surface is flat and has no curvature. This corresponds to um, Dirichlet for the tangential and Neumann for the normal component. 
so you see that it's it's hidden in the formalism there yeah mm -hmm. and maybe you can get it as a limit uh, if you if but then you still you still have some boundary conditions for example if you have a potential or or a jump in the electric and, and uh, magnet magnetic uh, the electric uh, um, what is it called constants you'd still have the same formalism and you still have to use boundary layers to describe it so i don't think that uh, it's any more regular if you use a potential instead of instead of boundary conditions because the operators are still unbounded individually the differences would still not be trace class you would still have to form this very particular linear combination but yeah, I mean, I also think that this is interesting. I mean, uh, you know, the, in the real world, I think uh, you very, very rarely have a perfect conductor, and it makes sense to to use other types of boundary conditions or or even use functions. But uh, if you choose a potential which is smooth, then the situation completely changes, and, and then there is a different formula. I think in this case, the stress energy tensor is not diversions free anymore. But I mean, this this uh, we wrote this also just to show that you can, you don't have to regularize it. The, the Kazumi energy is just you can just define it as a trace of an operator, and and this should be useful because there is this uh, very big area of spectral geometry, and people are interested in maximizing, minimizing you know, the first eigenvalue of a domain. Uh, but if you if you have like metallic object next to each other, it's a very natural question to ask. What configuration minimizes the Kazemi energy, and it's good that it, if it's a well-defined object. Thank you. Uh, any more questions? Not for the time being. Uh, let, let me maybe uh, well follow up on one of the last things you said uh, about um, perspective for constructing Hadamard states. Mm -hmm. how, how would that work? So what, what do you, what are the new new techniques that one, one could use this way? Um, no, I mean um, this is a Hadamard state uh, in in a, in some generalized sense. Sure. So if, if you take a manifold with boundary, so the objects, of course, the introduced boundary. Then if you go to space time, this would be a time-like boundary. And, and there is a notion of Hadamard state if you want, uh, but you don't really need that here because you know, this is a completely static situation. It's an ultra static situation. In fact, uh, there is no, um, you know, it's actually a product. The time variable is just crossed, you cross with R. So there is, an, there is an explicit formula for the Hadamard state using spectral decomposition. And if you use this formula for the Hanuma state, um, you get this. Uh, so this is actually what, what Jan Long did. It's the formula for the stress energy tensor. That's what you, the, the, this is what you get if you if you use the formula for the Hadama state and you do do this kind of regularization. So I guess the Hadama state would be this here times e to the i t uh -huh. modulus t times uh, Laplace plus m squared. To the power of one half. This is the Hadamard state. So, so it is not a Hadamard state. It is the Hadamard state. Yeah, Hadamard in a way, yeah, yeah. it's the Hadamard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. it's the ground state. So this right. is what this is here. Is you take the ground state with the Richley boundary conditions and you compare it to the ground state without any boundary conditions, and and then you realize that this actually has a singular. This this has a singular behavior near the boundary. Yeah. Okay, so so this is essentially, well, about constructing Hadamard states for manifolds with time-like boundary. Is that so right? That's what oh. you would, if you wanted to understand the the Casimir effect in an expanding universe, you would have to discuss exactly what you just said. Yeah. Cool. And and if you wanted, well, I mean, in principle, could one also use other boundary conditions, other Absolutely. boundaries like null yes. boundaries is that also possible or is it too crazy oh, that i don't know <laughs> i don't know i would be too crazy um <laughs> no but that, that's 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 pretty that's really good um thank you uh and, and any more questions 
Yeah, yes, I would like to ask a question. So I think these are very nice and beautiful formulas, uh, but it seems that you can compute only forces between solid objects. So for instance, there's this old problem with the, for the Casimir uh, energy. What is the Casimir energy of a sphere? Yes. And I think the calculation gives this result that the uh, energy is negative, but mm -hmm. this calculation is in my, to my knowledge, not rigorous. Yes. Because um, there are some infinities which are just neglected in this calculation. And uh, so, so I think in your calculation, you had to, to keep these, uh, 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 these boundaries uh, stable. Yep. Yes, exactly. So the, in fact, this breaks down if, uh, if you try to deform the boundary. And that's somehow what, this, what you would do if you wanted to know what the cosmic energy of a, of a hard sphere is. You would have to make change the sphere. Yes, and, yes. Uh, there is an old paper, I think, um, I forgot the authors now, who argue that this is actually, in, they are all, this, all these methods are actually incorrect because so this, this, all these regularization procedures, they, in a way, you can understand them as follows. So uh, let's see. So T00x zero zero is not integrable on the boundary, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but you can, you can actually expand it locally the asymptotic behavior, the way it's singular on the boundary is a local computation and is completely determined by the geometry there. So, so if you, as long as you don't deform this object, this will cancel out in the end, right? So that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you start deforming it, you are changing this infinite part. Yes, and, yes. And so, so that's why I think that if you, so if you want to measure forces between objects, right, you have to be able to move the objects a little bit to see to see what the response is in a detector. I would argue. So if you want, if you if you're putting the object in space, that costs an infinite amount of energy. And if you if you deform the object, I think it also costs an infinite amount of energy. So I would say maybe the, the cosmic energy on the sphere is probably <laughs> infinite in a way, in a way. And, and maybe you could argue that that therefore, if you start deforming it, then material parameters would enter. Uh, so that's what, what my thinking. I mean, I don't know if how conclusive all this is. I, ha I have uh, I don't think I completely understand understand this. Uh, but my impression was that there was a debate about this, and the authors of the paper, I've, I think, Candel maybe Candelas and some other people somehow concludes that that you may actually have you know on different sides you have different on different sides of the object you have you have different expansion parameters and, and everything becomes this whole argument wouldn't work anymore because you don't have these cancellations so that's why i i, I stayed away from from deforming the objects but i think that uh, that's an excellent question and it's i think that's i mean i do you know i mean i think that this has been done for, so very often people People take the scalar field and then they multiply by two and say, well, because the photon has two, two polarization directions. But this is not correct. I mean, one has to use uh, metallic boundary conditions oh, yes, yes. and relative boundary conditions. So I'm not sure if this um, if these computations were not done for the scalar field also. Mm -hmm. So I just don't know. I mean, it would work. maybe can you send me? The, I mean, I actually don't really know the reference for this computation. <laughs> um, oh, I don't remember where. Maybe I find it, yes. Yeah, yeah because I mean, I, I, I am aware of this. It's, I've read it in books, but I think this has, this was very, very old. And uh, maybe, you know, people like Pauli or Schrodinger have done these computations. So I have no idea. Yeah, it's certainly not rigorous, yes. It uses some regularization. And I think it's safer to, to have separate objects. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any more questions? <clears throat> Sorry, can I ask you uh, uh, so about the um, about the spectral shift function? Yes, yes. Uh, you mentioned that the German crane formula does not work in your situation. Yes, uh, yes. Apparently, because it is not trace class. Difference is not trace class. Yes. The difference is not trace class. Yes, but no, it's, it's also not integrable. It is Hilbert Schmidt class, yeah? No, it's not Hilbert Schmidt either. No, if it was Hilbert Schmidt, I don't think it. Sorry? 
yeah, what classes uh, resolve in difference? So let's go back uh, to this formula. Uh, so what you want to compute is this here, right? This uh, this is this is the trace that this is trace class. Yeah. But uh, you can trace. think of it as as a as a, the Beman Krein uh, would somehow be this operator minus this operator. Yeah. This would, would be the subject of the Beman Krein formula. So this operator minus the free one. Mm -hmm. and, and you can actually see that this whole thing is, is a linear combination of the thing that would you would get from Beman Krein from the combined object minus the thing that you would get from Beman Krein from the first object minus the thing that you would get from the Beman Krein formula for the second object. So we, it's maybe I didn't write it in, in a nice way here. But let's just consider this here minus this. This is not trace class either. It is not Hilbert Schmidt. Mm -hmm. Is this actually uh, still unbounded? And uh, so you, yeah. So, but it's not only the, it's not the only reason why the Beman Krein formula doesn't work. So what you would get yeah. if you wanted to you just formally apply the Beman Krein formula to to still compute the Kazem energy, you could try to do that, right? Well, you just don't care that this is not a trace class operator and you just use the Beerman Krein formula. What you would get is the same formula um, with the Beerman, with the spectral shift function, uh, sorry, with the spectral shift function in. It. So if you if you na naively used the Beerman Krein formula, uh, mm -hmm. you would get here the spectral shift function in this formula. Mm -hmm. But the asymptotic but behavior the asymptotic of the spectral behavior. shift function is like sine of uh, lambda essentially. So what you what you would try to integrate, uh, first of all, it would be an integral along the real axis. So you would have to integrate from zero to infinity sine of lambda d lambda. And that's not, it just doesn't, con it's not Riemann integrable, it's not Lebesgue integrable. It just doesn't converge. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you, you indicate this, um, this is a Simon formula. So D to N. So this is directly to Neumann method. What, what is two or what does it mean? Um, where exactly? Uh, it was on, on the slide when I... um, this is was a This is yeah, something part. about the ah. Dirichlet phenomenon. There is some echo. I, I I can hardly hear you. Can you just ask the question again because I, I couldn't hear it? No, no. In another in another slide. Yeah. O o okay. And. No. Here, maybe this. Yes. This one. This one. D to N. D to N. What does it? Dirichlet to Neumann. What does it mean? Yes, this is Dirichlet to Neumann. Sorry, that was because I didn't. Ah, this is. So Dirichlet to Neumann. This is the this is the sum of the interior Dirichlet to Neumann map. And the exterior ah. to Neumann map. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, my, my next question, if, if I have time, yes, yes is uh, the following What spectral information can you recover from the spectral shift? Um, uh, what spectral information? Well, it's. Uh, I mean, in this in this problem, the spectrum of the exterior Laplace is just absolutely continuous. And um, so the spec, I mean, it depends what you mean by spectral information. I mean, the, the, the scattering matrix. Well, maybe geometrical information. What kind of, ah. of uh, yeah, information? Yeah, yeah. Well, can I think you... that's a very classical question that I, I don't actually don't, I've, to be honest, I, I'm not an expert in this and I have forgotten the answer. Um, but I mean, this, this is a very classical uh, uh, problem. And um, yeah, what can you recover? I think quite a lot actually, but usually people assume that the scattering matrix is known, right? So from knowledge of the scattering matrix, I think you can reconstruct quite a bit. Um, if you're asking me, because the spectral shift is just the, the scattering phase, if you're asking me how much you can recover from the scattering phase, to be honest, I don't actually know what is known about this, but what you can see a little bit from this um, is that you can, um, you can recover, you know, for example, if you have two objects, you should be able to recover the distance between them and such things. Because of the, mm -hmm. of, the form, of these formulas and, and the wave trace formalism. 
but um, yeah. Ah, so I, so you can, for example, you can discover the you can recover the volume of the of the objects. That that's for sure because there is a while law for for a spectral shift function. So these kind of things you, you can recover. Um, but what what beyond that I don't I don't actually know. I would have to have to look. <laughs> I'm not an expert on this. Um, so there is a while formula for the spec for the spectral shift function. So it, it grows like the eigenvalue counting function, and you could argue that it replaces the eigenvalue counting function in the continuous case. So that's a very nice and uh, old result by, I think, Ralston and collaborators. Um, and I think also Richard Melrose proved this in great generality. Um, and then there are some further, there is this, um, maybe again, uh, Ralston and, and um, Bardosh, uh, uh, I seem to forget. Um, there is a trace formula which is similar to the to the Doistamat Gilliman trace formula that that allows you to Fourier transform the spectral shift function and then the singularities determine mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know information of lengths of lengths uh, Gilead trajectories. Gilead trajectories. Sorry, I've talked so long about it that I know I what the answer is. So the answer is that as much is known as, as for the spectral problem in, in, in the compact case, <laughs> because all the methods are the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, it might be time to uh, close at least the official part of the discussion. So thank you again, Alex, for this very, very nice much. talk.